This next part and for the next 70, 75 minutes is going to be where the intensive part of the, of the uh, content here with regards to strategic, strategery, and all of those other nice things. The first person on deck, good friend and, uh, and Alliance partner who's as much an entertainer as he is a businessman. So Eric uh, Shulman just got back from the UK. Uh, and he sends me a note this morning, says, you know, I don't even drink, but boy, do I, do I feel that jet lag. So without, w without further ado, I'm going to pass it right on to Eric, and he's going to address Chicks in the Arm. Uh, by the way, who in here has seen me speak before? Okay, I am not fully on my game today. I really am. Uh, Tuesday, my wife and I got back after two weeks on a cruise and spent time in London. What's kind of interesting is John talked about that two-mile radius for the shopping centers and such. Going to all the little towns in France and throughout uh, Europe, you s realize that why there are there so many churches? It's about that two-mile to four-mile rule, and they're separated by about that same... Uh, uh, so I learned some stuff today. Who's done a SWOT analysis on their business at some point? Do you know what SWAT stands for? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So, let's take a look at the different parts of the business that we have. I worked in management consulting for about an eight year period, uh, and Paul Castaneda, my VP, worked at the same management company. And I used to go into business owners and have conversations with them about these 10 areas of their business. So what I'd like you to do as part of the exercise is in your books, they have these categories listed. I'm going to have you rate yourself 1 to 10 in a minute, but before you start putting numbers down, let me take a couple of seconds and describe what a 10 looks like in each area. Now what I'm going to describe is completely unrealistic. It's perfection. Very few companies ever get there. So. 1 to 10, 5 being average, 10 being we're perfect, all others set their standards of when they look at us, they look at us to, to, to see how this should be done. One is we don't do that at all. So be fair, you don't have to share your score with anybody. The first one is business planning and vision. A company that's a 10 has a written plan and it's been shared with the company. Everybody in the company knows where we are, where we're headed, how we're going to get there. The mission strategy has been shared with everyone. Uh, and you can stop anyone in the hallway and they could tell you this information. That's a 10. So 1 to 10, rate yourself, 5 being average. Where are you in that category? And put a number down. Second one is human resources. You have the right people in the right places to be a 10. They're all well trained. You utilize them to their maximum extent. There's no waste when it comes to the manpower element of your business. That's what a 10, and, and it's managed well. You've got people who run it. You, people are happy. They, they, they enjoy being there. There's very, very little turnover. No bad hires. Organization. You've got a clear, defined structure. Everybody has a place in the structure. They know what their place is. Everybody follows that structure. You don't have people trying to leapfrog over others. Um, it's written. It's documented. It's a clear organizational structure. And it runs like a well-oiled machine, six days a week, five days a week. Sales and marketing. You're setting records in your industry. You, never have, you don't have down months. There's a predictable sales process and a duplicatable sales process in place. Your marketing runs like a well-oiled machine, and it's hitting the market segments and growing you where you need to go. That's what a 10 looks like. Next section, financial controls. You have complete control of your business. You know where your money is, where it's coming from. You're doing cash flow projections. You're hitting your projections. You're discounting bills rather than having to. You're not putting stuff on credit cards. You've got complete financial control of your business. The next one is pricing and costing. You're very competitive in the marketplace. You know what your margins are. You maintain margins. You're not discounting and giving away margin to get the business. You've studied this. You've got a total control of it would be a 10. Cash flow planning. You never run short of cash. 
You pay off the credit line every few months just because it makes you feel good. Um, money is coming in. You're, you know, you're looking for places to put the money. Be a 10. Inventory management. How many of you have inventory? Okay. You've got, Sean, in your, in your world, you're never overstocked. You're not getting stuck with anything. It flows in and out at a, at a, at a steady rate. You're never short of materials. Uh, it's just in time as necessary. When you can get the discounts by buying quantities, you buy the stuff that you can, and it does not affect your cash flow. Technology. You're at the leading edge, not the bleeding edge of technology. You've got all your computer systems, you've got the proper software in place, all your people are trained on how to use it. You make maximum use of technology and you get an ROI on your technology investment. It is, it's, it's, a, it's a profit center, not an expense center. You, the technology actually generates more money for you and lets you generate it more easily. Operations, again, that well-oiled machine, things happen when they're supposed to. You're not jumping in and putting out fires. Um, that would be a 10. Exit strategy and timing. You know, one of the interesting things is I saw a speaker a couple of years ago who was talking about exit strategies. Uh, and he asked the question, do you plan to die at the desk? <laughs> Nobody plans to die at the <laughs> desk, right? And how many are business owners in here like me? If I ask you, when are you going to retire, you know what the standard answer is? In about 10 years. If I ask you in two years, you know what the answer is? In about 10 years. One of the things I learned in that session was, if you're going to retire, put a date or an age on it and do it now. And at the end of that session, I put a date and an age on it. I'm going to be 67 in July. I want to retire my 71st birthday, four more years. Doesn't mean I'm going to stop working. I just want to be able to retire and hand my business off to somebody four years down the road. You've got that date in stone and you're working towards it. You've got the planners, you've hired the people, they've laid out the plan for you, one to 10, rate yourself in that area. Everybody got numbers down now? What's interesting is this. Take a look at the one that you rated yourself the highest on. Anybody rate themselves a nine or a 10 on anything? What'd you rate yourself, Morris? Pricing, costing. What'd you give yourself? Nine. How'd you get it there? Share it with the rest of us. How'd you get it there? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can answer that question. Uh, it's something, I mean, it's keeping in touch with the market. There you go. The market is negotiating appropriately. Keeping an eye on the competition. Yeah. Controlling costs, watching when stuff goes up. Anybody else? Score an eight or a nine on anything that you're proud of. Say, I called on somebody, now, but will raise their hand. Come <laughs> back, go ahead, Sean. I just got a couple of eights. What did you score, what are you most proud of? Oh, the culture that we've really Tell us a little bit about your corporate culture. Uh, I've been we, to your we, office, so I know we a little bit about it. We actually encourage failure, um, which, which promotes creativity and kind of <coughs> connects the portions of the brain that we need in order to uh, you know, make efficient decisions and grow as humans. We learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. Years ago, I was in the direct marketing business. I had a large direct marketing company for about 13 years. And I had a young lady who worked for me, and she made a horrible mistake. We were working with SunTrust. It was Sun Bank at the time. This was the 80s. And she didn't check and get a piece of paper signed off on by the client on the color for a program we did for a UCF Affinity Group credit card. And the gold was off by one Panatone number. And the girl who was, lady who was running the project was a UCF alumni. And she was livid about the fact that it was off by one tone of gold. And so I ate the cost of the printing. It was a $21,000 mistake. We got everything, by the way, it did not change the response rate. It was right where it should have been on the project. But to keep the company happy, to keep Sunbank as a client, we ate a $21,000 printing bill. A couple of days later, I called Paula into my office. I, we talked about what happened. And at the end, I said, OK, don't do this again. And she looked at me. She said, I thought for sure you were going to fire me. You know what I said to her? I just spent $21,000 educating you. Why would I fire you today? You'll never make that mistake again. So encouraging failure, not that you want them to make a mistake, but if they have the ability to make a mistake, 
You gotta give people that space. They're gonna grow. Now take a look at the areas that you need to work on, the twos, the threes, and the fours. And I think in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the PowerPoint it says circle a couple of them. Circle two or three of the areas that are your strengths. And what are the key areas you need to now work on? The areas you scored yourself twos and threes. Now you know where you need to begin. So how do we do a SWOT analysis? We list our strengths, our weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. If you look at the first page of this, here, I think you've got one in front of you. Um, what are the strengths that your company has? In my world, we have a very, we have a duplicatable process that gives predictable results. We have almost 300 offices around the world. We've been around for 40 plus years. And those are some of the strengths of my company. So what are some of the strengths of your company? Where are you weak? Does the company depend on you? Is it an inverted pyramid where you're the cause of what happens and if you fall off the end of the earth or you disappear, nothing happens when you're not there? What are the weaknesses? Will it survive without you? What are the opportunities? Where can you grow? And the threats, do you have competition? Is it price? <coughs> With oil prices going up, is that going to affect you? Is it going to affect your shipping? How's that going to affect you? If you go take a look at the ne next page in the handout that I gave you, you concentrate on the strengths. What is one of the strengths of your company, <coughs> Jose? One of, one of the things that you scored yourself high on, what's the strength area? Um, By the way, I am, I am interactive. When I ask questions, I will wait for answers. And the people in the back, you're not safe. I'm there in a second. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jose. So strength technology. Nice. Good. So what's an action you can take based on technology to pour gasoline on that fire? Is there something you could do? Probably people in the organization that's still getting a little more training. So put down technology and then put down action training. Will that have a high impact, a medium impact, or a low impact on the company if you train them better in the technology? Or oh, medium impact. Medium impact. Good. Who's going to be responsible for doing that? Because the next thing is who, right? Who's accountable for that? You can assign that to somebody within the company. And when do they need to do it by? Now you've got something very, very specific to do. You need to pick the areas you're going to work on, list what needs to get done, who's going to do it, and do the high impact ones first. And put a date on it. A goal without a date is a fantasy. I'm opening a new business next week. In fact, Ray, I want to get together with you and Jim and go over to Orange County. I'm ready for that now. It's called the Harassment Prevention Council. We do measurement within large organizations to see whether they're vulnerable to be sued or based on the corporate culture and the beliefs of the people within the company. So the strengths of that is it's very timely, right? It's in the news. There's no competition out there at all doing this. The weaknesses are we're a small organization. We're going to grow very rapidly. We could get, we have growth issues. So, with strengths, you list all these things. List what you want to work on, the action that needs to be taken, the impact it's going to have, who's going to be accountable, the date you want to get it done by. You do the exact same thing with weaknesses. You know, is it, is it a, if it's a weakness in human resources, do I need to hire different people? Put it in. Will I have a high impact, medium impact, or low impact? I have a sales team that's not performing, okay? That's a weakness, okay? The action, hire better salespeople. Who's going to do that? Fred, Ricky, or Lucy, or Ethel, right? <laughs> Will it have a high impact? Yes. When do you want to get it done by? By the, by the first of June would be good, right? Within the next 30 to 60 days, so you put a date on it. Now you have very specific things you're going to work on. Opportunities, areas for growth things you could improve upon, the exact same list of actions. I can take an hour and a half and do this. I'm going to get this through, through this quickly so the other people have some time and so that you guys can get out of here on time. Because I know that when the mind will only absorb as long as the butt will endure. That was a quote from Einstein. 
Late in his life, he was doing the rubber chicken circuit, and he would be called into these universities. He was in his 80s. And it'd be a six o'clock dinner, and of course, the head of the mathematics department, the head of the physics department, the dean, the assistant dean, all had to do comments. Around quarter of nine, he's sitting there. He's been sitting there for three hours. He literally got up and said, ladies and gentlemen, the mind will only absorb as long as the butt will endure. Thank you and good evening. That was his whole speech for the night. So we'll get you out of here on time. Um, opportunities. And what are the threats? that you need to face? And what actions do you need to take? What, what, what about losing a key employee? Somebody who may be aging out, or somebody whose spouse gets a job somewhere else and he or she has to leave? That's a threat, right? Especially if it's a key person. Well, the action you can take is to train the people underneath them. Good. Who's going to be responsible for doing that? When do you need to get that done by? When you do this, you go to the very last sheet, which is the consolidation of all of this. Great. So I then take all of these sheets and put it on this tool, and I have a one-page what-to-do list to improve my company. By the way, this tool comes out of the Sandler Enterprise Selling Program. How many of you sell to large organizations or organizations that have multiple layers of decision maker? There's an entire program. This is one of the 17 tools that's within the program. When was the last time you did a SWOT analysis on your business? Now, you don't have to just do it on your business. I've done this on a specific account. Think about a key account you've got. What are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats with that account? What about a territory? You're opening a territory, a new territory, or you're bringing a new product on board. Do you do a SWOT analysis before you bring the new product on board, before you go to open the new territory, before you hire the new rep? You can do this on your life. You can do this on your retirement. You can do this on your relationship. SWOT analysis does not have to be all intellectual. It's, it's a real, live, living document, and you review it. Do it again in a month. Some of the stuff you will have fixed. Some of the stuff you're going to still be working on. It's an exercise you need to be doing. If anybody wants a copy of this in a PDF form, send me an email, eric at sandler.com. I'll send you a copy of this, and you can actually have one that you can write on over and over again and just save different versions of the document. If you don't take action, it's a complete waste of time. So second thing I would tell you to do is get an accountability partner. Have someone else, another CEO, do you, who coaches you as a business owner? Do you have a coach? Someone you talk to that can call bullshit on you when you don't do what you said you were going to do. We all need a coach. I have a gentleman up in New Jersey. His name is Kevin Schulman. He's actually another Sandler trainer. We're not related. We call each other cousin. But every Tuesday morning at 6.30 a.m., I'm on the phone with Kevin. How's it going? Hey, you said you were going to do this last week. How did it go? You didn't get it done? Shame on you. Another way you can do this is this. Take this and get an accountability partner and pair up with them. And you do something like this. Todd, you and I are going to be accountability partners to get the things done we've done in our SWOT analysis. I'm going to give Todd a $500 check out of my personal checking account that he's going to stick up on the wall over his desk. He's going to give me a $500 check that I'm going to stick up on the wall over my desk. We're going to make commitments to each other each week. The first week I don't do what I committed to him, he gets to cash my check and I have to give him another one to hang on the wall. It's got to be enough that it hurts. Could be 100 bucks, could be 500 bucks, but it's got to be enough that it would hurt. And you got to tell the other person what you're going to do with the money. It'll hurt even more. You will do more. <laughs> you will do more, ladies and gentlemen, to hang on to that 500 bucks than you will to make 50,000. I don't want to be embarrassed when I talk to Todd tomorrow. I've put off doing it all week. I know I got to talk to him tomorrow morning. Today I actually get it done. Hey man, you almost got the the 500 bucks, but well, yesterday afternoon, I realized I didn't want to give it to you, so I got, got this all done. 
You'll do more to save 500 bucks than you will to make 50,000. The mind works in weird ways, you know? We get what we focus on. So what are you focused on? How many golfers in here? Any golfers in here? I used to play a lot of golf. I don't so much anymore. But I used to have trouble out at, uh, was it, is it, uh, at, uh, at Legacy Club. There's one par five. There's a long shot about 150, 175 yards over the water. You know what I'm talking about? And I used to hate that hole. Oh, here comes number, I think it's number 13. Yeah, I'd I, I, I ride up to it, oh man, number 13, I'm always in the water, right? And so as I go to get the ball out of the bag, I get an old ball, right? I set up as far away from the water as I can. What am I thinking about right here? Please don't go in the water, right? Right about here, I'm thinking, please don't go in the water. What am I focused on? The water. One day I decided I wasn't going to be in the water anymore. I said, you know what? I'm no longer in the water here. So I, as I approached the hole, I said, good, this is going to be easy. I got out a brand new ball, set up as close to the water as I could. <laughs> and now I was focused on that spot over by the sand trap there, just to the left of the sand trap. And now I'm focused on something else. So you get what you focus on. This is nothing more, ladies and gents, than a focusing tool to keep you focused on what the goal is, what are you specifically trying to do? I don't know about you ladies and gentlemen, but I, I get an awful lot coming at me all during the day. The phone's ringing, my employees are coming in, they're always being corrupted. You got a minute, 45 minutes later, they're still sitting there. Let me give you a tool that will help with that. It's called an upfront contract. Somebody comes into your office today to interrupt, you say, I, 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 you got a minute? You put your hand up and say, what's it concerning? Subject, the XYZ account. How long will it take? 10 minutes. All right, Glenn, you got 10 minutes. If it takes longer than 10 minutes, you'll need to come back this afternoon. Go. And what happens is all of the, what'd you do over the weekend goes away. They've got five minutes or seven minutes or 10 minutes. It'll save you a tremendous amount of time. Any questions on the SWOT analysis? I got a little off topic there. Is this helpful? Okay, use it. You can make money with this. Send me an email, I'll send you a copy of it. Gary? Yeah, so I'm, I'm Gary Cohen with MP, M, uh, M Perspective uh, CFO Strategic Services. And a lot of times when we go into clients, this is what we help them do. We help guide them through uh, a SWOT analysis because you can't really know where your business is, where your business is going, uh, unless you understand what we're doing well, where we need to improve, and also um, what opportunities there are to get better, and then what's lurking uh, in the woods, I'm going to talk about this a little bit, a little bit later. But um, sometimes uh, somebody may see an opportunity, and maybe it isn't the right one. Um, a right one could be, say, uh, you have a, you're uh, an owner of a group of chiropractic offices, and you're telling your patients, you know, you need to get a foam roller so you can exercise your muscles, or you could use a personal stim unit at home, or you need to work on your nutrition through better vitamins. Well, if, if you have those items available. Uh, to sell, you, it, it works perfectly in line with your business. So the key is trying to figure out what do we do great and what also is in line with what we do is an opportunity to, to grow what we do. Um, so this, this SWOT analysis is very structured, it's very disciplined, and it's usually very revealing um, to, to help you move forward. This will make you uncomfortable when you do it. If you're not uncomfortable, you're not being honest with yourself. It's a look in the mirror. You gotta realize you do have a blemish and you are getting gray hair and the hair is going away and then you're, you're dealing with what you really see, not what you want to see. It's not Snapchat where you get the, the fun stuff put on you, you grow ears. This is a real picture of where you're at. Yeah, I think a lot, a lot of times, um companies may not realize uh, those areas. Uh, it could be in marketing. Um, we, we cut the pie and uh, what do we do to market to our current customers with our current products or services that we do great? Hey, that's our core. Um, what are we doing to sell our current products and services to new customers? Is it in a new geographic area? Uh, is it a, a different age group or a different demographic? And then what, what do we do to uh, sell these 
ancillary products and services like I just spoke with uh, to our current customers? And then are, are there new opportunities, something that's totally different, that's cutting edge, that still fits with what we do, um, that we're not doing, that we may be able to grab a hold of before our competitors get there? And so that's just one area of a SWAT, looking at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats in our marketing and growing our customer base. But the key is in, in every area, you know, what do we do in operations well? What are we not doing? What are our opportunities to get better? Financially, what, what are we doing there? Um, are we uh, using uh, the accrual method property? Is like, wow, yeah, February was a bad month because we had $60,000 in insurance expense. Ooh, so we lost money. Well, no, maybe you paid for the whole year and you needed to set it up as prepaid insurance and amortize 5000 a month. Some companies aren't doing that. They think, well, that was just a bad month. That's when we paid our insurance. Um, etc. Revenue. I got a contract and I'm going <coughs> to provide this service for the next year and um, I just got $120,000 up front to provide this service for 12 months. Hey, I had a great month, $120,000 in revenue. No, you, you had $10,000 and we need to defer the other hundred and ten and recognize ten per month. Some companies aren't doing that so they don't really get a good picture on a monthly basis of how they're doing because they're not matching revenues and expenses. So that can be a weakness that gives you a false financial picture of how you're performing either on the good side or on the bad side because you're not doing, you're not matching your revenues and your expenses. Um, that's just a couple examples in the financial area. Are you as owners getting um, the, the financial data you need to run your organization? Do you know what your margins are? Do you know what your margins are by product line or by service line? Are you allocating overhead to departments or to, to geographic locations? Um, if you are allocating overhead, are you doing it simply? Like, well, I've got five locations, this is how much revenue, I'll just allocate overhead based on revenue. And maybe there are, are, are more in-depth ways to do that. So when, we, when you do the SWOT analysis, you start looking at all these different areas of your business and figuring out um, how to do them better and how to provide more useful information so you can run your business better and more efficiently and more effectively. You can look at things like client retention. You can look at things like repeat clients as opposed to one-time clients. And looking at specific product lines. I, you know, McDonald's has got the, the best upsell in the world. Would you like fries with that? When you look at your product and service, when they buy product A, what would they also buy? They buy a, a bolt, they need a nut, right? And they probably need a washer, and they probably need a screwdriver. So if you're in that industry, are you selling just the bolts? Or are you selling the nuts, the washers, and then the screwdrivers that go along because you can grow your unit sale? Yeah, I think the recurring revenue is interesting. Like I have a client that's a roofing and siding contractor, and after the hurricane hits, well, boom, they're slammed with roof re-roofs and roof repairs and scrambling to find roofers who can do this. And that goes for six to eight months, and then that all goes away. But what continues on is their business relationships with uh, their customers who are building one apartment complex and then when that ends they're going to build another one or assisted living facility we're going to work on an assisted living facility number one but over the next 12 years we're going to build eight of them and because we have a relationship with that general contractor we know we're going to have a great chance to be working on all eight of those assisted living facilities there may not be another hurricane for five or ten years uh, that ups our re-roof and our repair revenue but we know because of our great business relationships with that general contractor, we're most likely to have a, a, a tremendous shot at that recurring revenue on project after project after project. So those are the types of things you know we're, we're looking at. You could do a SWOT analysis on your bank. You can do a SWOT analysis on your accountant. Not 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 your, not not Jeff and his group, but <laughs> your other accountant if you're not using him. Um, Todd, with what you do. A SWOT analysis on how we're spending money within a company, right? Exactly. Uh, Glenn, SWOT analysis on my retirement plan, right? What are the strengths of it, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats to it? Because that's what you do for a living. You do SWOT analysis for your clients on their situation. Well, you need to do one yourself, ladies and gents. This is not a comfortable exercise, as I said. This is a chance where you actually stand in front of the mirror and say, you know, I could lose a few pounds. 
Questions? <coughs> if there's no questions, is that a good sign or a bad sign? Good sign. <laughs> it could be known <laughs> by. Uh, the, the, I, th I think a lot of that looking in the mirror really, it really is revealing that um, often uh, we get so busy moving forward with what we're doing that we forget to take time. I, I know uh, one of my clients said we have to have time to just um, reflect and think. Um, the SWOT analysis, it puts a little structure and discipline to the reflecting and thinking, but if, if we're so busy doing what we're doing um, on a daily basis that we don't have time to reflect and think in an unstructured manner and into a SWOT analysis with a, in a more structured manner, um, things are going to come up and, and we're not going to take advantage of all our opportunities and uh, our strengths and we're definitely, our weaknesses are going to get us and threats are going to sneak up on us. So that the opportunity to reflect and think is extremely important for uh, C-level personnel. You may not be able to fix all your weaknesses. I'm five foot six. I'm never going to be six foot. So if you can't fix the weakness, what can you put in place? I'll hire a tall guy or a tall lady. <laughs> or I'll marry a woman who's four foot six and a half, which I did 24 years ago. <laughs> she still thinks I have hair, by the way, because all she can see is this right here. <laughs> By the way, if you're not having fun in business, you're doing it wrong. My corporate vision statement is six words. Have fun, help people, make money. And since I'm in the training business, it's have fun, help people make money. Works both ways. And my whole staff knows that's the vision. We're here to enjoy ourselves, want our clients to enjoy ourselves, and we're all here to make money for you and for myself. And that's very, very clear, and that can be communicated. If you have a corporate vision statement that's two paragraphs long, your people aren't going to remember it. Simpler is better. What they used to have up on Facebook on the wall, done is better than perfect. It worked for a period of time. So let me ask you this. What are you going to do? What, what are you going to do a SWOT analysis on in your business? What's the area that you're going to work on? I'd say it's uh, a, a marketing to sales. Okay. And are you going to go outside for the marketing stuff? No, or you, have, you have internal people that do that. Internal people. Good. When are you going to do it? <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I give them by noon. <laughs> no, no, no. You could commit to having the SWOT analysis done by next Friday. That would be a good start. I will complete my SWOT analysis by next Friday. Put it on your calendar and make sure it happens. Then decide what you're going to analyze. But ladies and gentlemen, if you don't do it, if you don't put it down before you leave here today, I guarantee you, you will put this off. We're going to cover procrastination, right? Um, Can we cover that next month? Would that be okay? <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Anything else to say here? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit later on on you know, exit strategy, building your value in your company. But probably one thing which everybody should do a SWOT on is their customer diversification. Uh, I remember uh, back in the 80s, a friend of mine, his company uh, produced all the socks for Nike at a hosiery mill in North Carolina. And it was 70% of their business. And then as Nike got bigger and bigger, Nike was growing, but as it got bigger and bigger and bigger, Nike had to start producing elsewhere, and it ended up being overseas, and then pretty soon everything went overseas. And then that 70% of the business uh, was gone. Um, if, if you have a business and you have 10 million in sales, and you've got, to make it simple, 10 customers that each provide a million dollars in your revenue, well, each one's worth 10% of your business. If one goes away, you take a hit, but you still got 90% of your uh, sales. If you've got 10 million sales and, and one of them is 50%, one's 25% and then there's five at 20% at 5%, um, you know, that 50% customer and that 25% customer can be devastating. If you lose them, yes, you want to keep them, but what can you do to grow your top line to where the customer who's providing five million of your 10 million revenue, if several years later they're providing five million of 25 million in revenue, now they're only 20% of your sales. They're still big, but they're a, a much smaller percentage. And um, are, are you staffed and, and are you working hard to figure out a worst case scenario if I did lose that big customer, 
what do we have to do to function as a company? So with your SWOT analysis, it's, uh, it's going to help you build on your strengths, but it's going to also help you look at those threats. That what happens if something big time bad like that does happen? And can we continue as a company? What do we have to do? So um, I think I'd look at customer diversification probably as one of the big areas of SWAT. You also may look at industry diversification. Those people who had a lot invested in the construction industry 10 years ago hit a brick wall. So if you're only working in one particular industry, like construction, or like tourism, or like uh, uh, training, uh, if I only trained people in the construction business, I'd be in sad shape when the, when the recession hit. Fortunately, we trained across a lot of different spectrums. And again, 10%, I think is the max, 5% would be better. No customer more than 10% of your total growth. And, if, and it's fine, if you got one that, that comes on board and they're now gonna be 30%, you gotta grow so that you reduce that percentage to 10%. That becomes a sales issue. Does, does anybody in here have a customer that's uh, over 25% or over 50% of your total time? So a little vulnerable. So there could be some vulnerability there. Now if you own the other company, it sort of mitigates the vulnerability. But if it's an outside company, Sears years ago used to, uh, you come up to, with Sears, I know Sears was mentioned earlier, with a brand new wrench or a new tool, and they'd love it, and they'd order, they said we want 100,000 of them. And you then gear up your factory, start producing 100,000 a month for them, and six months later, they say, look, we can get this done in China a lot cheaper. You're gonna to have to drop your price. Well, you've just made millions of dollars in infrastructure investment based upon um, something that can go away. Any questions for Gary or myself? Yes. Is there a major difference between a company that already is established and has all the different departments versus a more of a startup style that you're still kind of working through that business model where, you know, like for us, for example, last year there was a $12 billion economic development cut in the state, meaning our major funders either died themselves or went on survival mode. So that cut... And you were selling into that market? Yes. Um, what do you sell? So we help high net worth individuals uh, find deal flow in the state of Florida. So they find what? Deal flow, companies to invest in and create their own portfolio, okay. from individual investors to corporations. Um, so our model was we'll help you uh, get private investment to match public dollars, we'll help mobilize the high net worth individuals and get to know your own community with what companies are actually growing. Um, a lot of those institutions went away or they got cut about 50% or more. Uh, so, <coughs> are, are, can you approach the companies that want to get in directly? To what? In other words, are there companies that you could contact without the, the corporate, the funding, and get them to pay you directly to do that? I mean, the companies that come to us are seeking investment from investors, uh, and then we have corporations that are looking to get new innovation and uh, the companies that are coming out of Florida. So the monies have dried up from the investor side? The, well, they pay membership, but that's not enough to cover everything. Let's talk offline on that. Okay. I may have a couple of suggestions for you because we want to we want to get you guys out of here at no later than 1230, so we're trying to stay on track here. Yep. Well, I think I, and a little, an, an additional point, I think a lot of times those growing companies, um, they don't have the whole management staff because they haven't grown to that point. So they may need an outside HR person. They may need someone like us as an outside CFO that's there a small amount of time. Outside marketing, um, a lot of the people in this room and a lot of other people that can help them have a management team that's not full time, but that gives them the strength of a management team of a large organization and that helps um, investors see that we, there's a good team guiding this company even though everybody's not full time on staff. So that can be helpful. I have an outside marketing person that I use like that. They're X number of dollars a month. She handles everything just like she's an internal employee. So outsourcing some of that may be, but I don't think that's where your issue is. Talk to me afterwards. Okay. Good deal. Thank yeah. okay. Thanks, man. Okay.